Um, as you may know, I'm Rebecca Markert. I'm the legal director here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And tonight I'm here to present the Clarence Darrow Civil Liberties Award to our next speaker. So I'm gonna show you the award. It's very heavy, so it's not gonna be up for long. <laughs> But this is a, an award that's not just a statuette. It's actually a miniature replica of a seven foot tall statue sculpted for FFRF by Zenas Fredakis on the grounds of a county courthouse in Dayton, Tennessee. FFRF placed it there to commemorate the Scopes trial and to balance out the grounds which had a statue of Williams Jenni William Jennings Bryan. Previous recipients of this award include Representative Jamie Raskin, actor John Delancey, and journalist Linda Greenhouse, just to name a few. This year, FFRF is proud to present the Clarence Darrow Award to Ellie Mistal. Ellie <laughs> Ellie is the justice correspondent for The Nation where he writes about politics and social and racial justice. His first book, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guide's Guide to the Constitution, made the New York Times bestsellers list in April 2022. He is also the host of Contempt of Court, a podcast series by The Nation in which he says, I'll look at ways to make the Supreme Court stop hurting us. Ms. Stahl was the executive director or executive editor of Above the Law, a website that focuses on law, courts, and justice. He's known for writing about law and politics, breaking down Supreme Court decisions, and up to the minute coverage of Supreme Court confirmation battles. Ali received his undergraduate degree in government from Harvard University and his JD from Harvard Law School. He's appeared regularly on MSNBC since 2018, appearing in shows like All In with Chris Hayes, The Beat with Ari Melber, AM Joy with Joy Reid, and Up with David Gora. So in a review that I found for his book, Ellie is described as one of America's funniest lawyers. And I have to agree. Following his Twitter, or I guess we're calling it X now account, during the Supreme Court term is an absolute must for me. Um, and I've also pushed it onto my legal team. He adds so much levity while we hear oral arguments on some of the hardest cases to hear as civil rights attorneys or after reading some of the gut punch decisions that we've received from the Supreme Court these last two years. But he also writes and explains the cases in a way that's accessible to all and he tells it like it is. And unlike many in our legal profession, he's not afraid to speak the truth about what's happening at the Supreme Court. So I'm just gonna give you a taste of the things that he's written, um, headlines like theocrats on the Supreme Court strike again, or tweets like this for 303 Creative. He wrote, first case is 303 Creative. That's the one where the bigot doesn't have a website but wants to make one that will discriminate against gay couples. <laughs> Gorsuch, 63 says that her bigotry is okay. Another one, um, that I like to repeat often is, as always, people who think the court is bound by its own logic are not being realistic about how comfortable conservatives are with their own hypocrisy. <laughs> and then just one final one that's not related to the Supreme Court, but one that I read, shared with staff, and what prompted me to ask Annie Laurie to invite him to address this convention was the tweet where he describes a conversation with a receptionist during a medical appointment with his son. So he sets the scene, checking in my kid for a blood test. The receptionist is putting him into the system. She asks, religion? He says, he doesn't have one. The receptionist says, really? And he says, he's seven. The, <laughs> the receptionist says, what's yours? He says, ma'am. And the receptionist says, well, it has a field here for, and he says, put down Minecraft. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Ali Mastal.
Sorry, picture time. Hold on. <laughs> Do you want to hold it? It's pretty heavy. All right. Thank you so much for this honor. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for caring about these important issues. Obviously, when we're talking about religion and the freedom from thereof, we are talking about fundamentally a legal problem. And I'm going to talk a lot about those legal problems, but uh, obviously, uh, the events of the last week, I believe, bring into stark relief why this conference and our pleas for secular political solutions to conflicts are so important. <clears throat> solutions that respect the, and acknowledge the humanity and dignity and safety of all peoples regardless of their spiritual beliefs. But I am no expert on global geopolitics, I'm not an expert on terrorism, or security, or colonialism. I don't have a solution. If I did have a solution, frankly, I wouldn't be talking to you guys. I'd be talking to the good people in Stockholm, and I would tell them all about my solution, and then wait for my prize. <laughs> <laughs> what I am an expert in, or at least what I play as an expert on TV, as at least until the actor's strike is over, um, is American law, and its constitutional promise to craft a country not based on a shared religion, not based on a shared ethnicity, not based on a shared culture, but a shared commitment to the rule of law and secular equality. <clears throat> on that front that I know something about, I can tell you that America is failing. We are failing as a secular nation and devolving into a brutal theocracy. And that failure is being led by the Supreme Court, which acts more like an unelected clergy than an impartial panel of judges. <clears throat> the heart of that failure goes to the Supreme Court's decision that there is religious tension written right into the First Amendment and its decision to resolve that tension in the favor of fundamentalist Christians and nobody else. As most people here know, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Lawyers call these two ideas the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. And on paper, they make a lot of sense, right? The government will not force people into a religion, and it will not stop people from practicing whatever they want. In practice, this country has always treated the Establishment Clause as an annoyance that mainly is there to get in the way of people saying Merry Christmas, <laughs> while putting a whole lot of effort into the Free Exercise Clause, so long as the, the religion that you wish to exercise freely involves some mention of Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. You know, bringer of good news, bringer of pizza, whatever it is. But as long as you have some mention of Jesus Christ, you're free to exercise your religion in whatever way you see fit. If you don't have that, if you have no religion, if your religion does not venerate Jesus Christ, then suddenly the country remembers that we're supposed to be secular and that we have an establishment clause that's supposed to prevent your exercise of your religion. Don't believe me? Try having your kids pray seven times a day in the middle of school instead of praying just once on Sunday. And while you're there, tell me why Sunday isn't a school day to begin with. <laughs> See, America doesn't need to establish an official religion because it doesn't, because it already has. Christian theological practices are already embedded into the very definition of what we otherwise call secular norms, right? If, if we were a truly free, religiously free country, Christmas would not be the holiday that everybody has a day off of. The Monday after the Super Bowl would be the holiday that everybody has a day off of. 
even things as simple as, as obvious as the American military, which, you know, the army, which forces its new recruits to shave their heads and beards and when they're signing up. That sounds secular until you remember that beard length is pretty important in lots of cultures. I, pro- I don't even have to go, I put pro- like this, Gimli, son of Gloin, <laughs> would view being made to shave his beard as anything but secular, and instead a bit of wee elvish indoctrination. Okay, but this is gonna surprise some people because despite everything I just said, for the most part, I am okay with this country's laxity when it comes to the Establishment Clause. Because bottom line, political rights and participation in this country are not gated behind religious faith. Jews can still vote in this country. Muslims can still run for office and win in this country. Is it harder for people who are Jews or Muslims or non-Christians or atheists to run for office and win and do these things? Yes, it's harder, demonstrably, demonstrably so. But it's not prohibited, which is more than I can say about a lot of other places in the world. At a technical level, the Establishment Clause is satisfied even if we often fail to live up to the spirit behind the clause. My establishment clause problems are not actually about civil rights, civil liberties, or even cultural domination. My establishment clause problems are when people are forced to subjugate their literal bodies to satisfy Christian puritanical theocracy. The idea that people in the LGBTQ community should, be treated, should not be treated with dignity and respect in the, mar- in the marketplace, that's not a secular cultural norm, but a religious imposition. The idea that pregnant people cannot seek reproductive health care because such health care makes Jesus cry, <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> is the clearest example we have today of the U.S. government establishing one religion over all others. Because you see, the entire abortion debate debate should be inextricably linked from the Establishment Clause debate. Abortion should be constitutional under the right to privacy. And just for a second while we're here, if you happen to be one of those people who doesn't believe in the right to privacy, I got something for you. Abortion should also be legal under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And if you don't like that, abortion should also be legal under the 9th Amendment's protection of unenumerated rights. And if you don't like that, abortion should also be legal under the 8th Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment because I can think of nothing more cruel than being raped in prison and then being forced to carry a baby to term. And if you don't like all that, I'm not a... (laughs) And if you don't like all that, abortion should be legal at the very least under the 13th Amendment of the Constitution, which prohibits slavery. Because I can think of nothing more unconstitutional than forced labor without compensation. (laughs) But I digress. Banning abortion should be unconstitutional under the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. And that's because the idea that life begins at conception is an entirely Christian, really fundamentalist Catholic idea, and it's one that's not shared by many other faiths. Many other faiths view uh, birth as the beginning of life, and until then it is, is the life of the mother that is paramount in those faiths. And you will note, for the atheists in the crowd, which I believe there are some here, (laughs) you'll note that no other secular operation of law attaches at conception. We don't start collecting taxes at conception. Pregnant people don't get two votes when they show up to the ballot box because of conception. Citizenship certainly doesn't attach at conception, now does it? And in fact, most of the people who argue against Uh, who argue that life begins at conception, will still argue that those lives can be deported, denied health care, or medical benefits, or educational benefits, or any other governmental service. At the point where people are being denied health care because of what other people think their God wants, at the point where women are being denied life-saving services from medical issues we know how to fix, 
but we can't because the doctors treating them are afraid of an inquisition after the treatment, then I tell you, we are not a secular nation. We are a theocracy with better marketing. <laughs> and that's just my problem with the religious actors on the court who ignore the establishment clause. That's not even, to me, the most dangerous aspect of the Supreme Court's approach to religion. And that's because the court spends most of its time supercharging the free exercise clause and using it to suborn bigotry by any means necessary. The free exercise clause is supposed to be a shield against government overreach, right? The people who wrote the Constitution, as the last speaker just eloquently put, people who knew that wrote the Constitution knew damn well this was going to be a Christian nation no matter what anti-establishment principles they wrote in to the Constitution. The free exercise clause was supposed to be the escape hatch for non-believers. And again, not even really for non-believers, right? They were supposed to be the escape hatch for the people in the crucible, all right? It's supposed to defend people against Christian overreach. But that is not how the current Supreme Court uses it. The Supreme Court uses the free exercise clause as a sword. They use it to force others who do not agree with the precepts of fundamentalist Christianity to live and work under its yoke, one bigoted baker at a time. <laughs> Essentially in this country, any bigot with a dream can claim that their bigotry was ordained by Jesus Christ. Then they can claim that the normal operation of secular laws that would restrict their or curtail their bigotry, like say a generally applicable anti-discrimination law, they say that those laws cannot be applied to them without violating the free exercise of their own religion. And remember, we are not talking about people who want to be bigoted in the privacy of their own homes, which they are certainly free to do. I myself am horribly bigoted against stupid people. <laughs> I don't like them. I don't like going to parties with them. I certainly don't want them to marry into my family. <laughs> Terribly prejudiced against, super, uh, against stupid people. And I am allowed to do so. In fact, just on the subject of stupid people, we're not even talking about people with the weird desire to be bigoted in public and kind of go out there and drool about who they hate today or tomorrow. Like, the Constitution protects their rights to be like that. No, we're talking about bigots who want to enter the secular public sphere and use their so-called spirituality-based bigotry to deny goods, services, opportunities, and public accommodations to others. That is precisely where the Constitution is supposed to draw the line. But the Supreme Court will not draw that line. Instead, the, co the court consistently rules that the free exercise clause is harmed every time a secular anti-discrimination law forces a person to not discriminate. The court uses the free exercise clause to trump all other constitutional principles, including the 14th Amendment's protection of uh, grants of equal protection to everybody. Apparently, we are all entitled to equal protection under the law unless we're gay and want to adopt a child. Then that same equal protection doesn't apply to us. The desires of a religious organization that the state has put in charge of adoptions, which, like, why are we even doing that? <laughs> but the desires of a religious organization that the state has put in charge of, of adoptions must be respected over the equal protection to all people who happen to want to adopt a child. That's what the Supreme Court tells us. The trick, the thing that the Supreme Court uses, the word play that it gets into, is this word hostility. They've interpreted anti-discrimination laws as hostile to religion, specifically Christian faiths. They get around the Establishment Clause and, as Lisa pointed out, their own presidents, which they straight do not care about, <laughs> because they claim to be able to divine 
hostility from generally applicable secular laws. The court would have you believe that anti-discrimination laws target people of faith. Of course, the court is wrong. Those laws do no such things. Those laws target bigotry and discrimination. Now, if the practice of your faith happens to lead you to run afoul of those anti-discrimination laws, well, as they say in my community, hit dog hollers. <laughs> Maybe if you are constantly running afoul of anti-discrimination laws, your practices, practicing of your faith is a little bit discriminatory. That's the view at 30,000 feet. And for the rest of my time, I want to kind of zoom in and talk about two specific cases. And just so you know, I'm going to have time to take questions. Think of your questions. I'll take as many um, as I can. But I do want to talk specifically about two recent cases that kind of highlight just how far the court has gone away from any kind of normal operation of the First Amendment and how deep they are into this kind of a theocratic overreach that I keep talking about. The first case, I'm sure many of you are aware of, it's called Kennedy v. Bremerton. This is the praying football coach case. Um, Joe Kennedy, fighting Joe Kennedy, um, was a football coach in Washington who had the kink of uh, enjoying to pray in the middle of the football field after every game. Yeah, I'm sure Jesus says something about something doing it in private and God sees in public, but eh, not for Joe. Joe wanted to make sure people saw him pray in the middle of the 50-yard line. <laughs> the school was concerned. It was a public school in Washington State. They were like, Joe, you can't do this. You got to pray in the line. Joe was like, no. All right, well, Joe, well, Joe you got to pray maybe after the, no, I'm going to pray at 50-yard line after every game. And it became a Supreme Court case. And the Supreme Court ruled six to three that the school, not Kennedy on the student, that the school impinged on Kennedy's free exercise of religion. Okay, not that Kennedy, the football coach, imposed on the free exercise of the religion of his football players, but that the school, by asking, Ken not telling Kennedy you can't pray, but asking Kennedy not to pray at the 50 yard line at the end of every freaking football game, that, <laughs> That impinged on Kennedy's freedom of religion. Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote that the school was, and I'm quoting here, hostile to Kennedy's religious choice. But here's the thing. To get to his 6-3 majority opinion, Neil Gorsuch had to lie. Gorsuch had to make up a different Joe Kennedy, a private one who only prayed by himself long after the game in a dark and empty stadium with one, there was one picture that they used in the case. It was, it was like Joe Kennedy by the lights of like a, a headlights of one lone car shone out on the front as he took his knee. And <laughs> that man didn't exist. Instead, he was rushing out into the middle of the field as soon as the final whistle blew to do a prayer. He was leading his other, all the players in prayer, standing in the middle of them like he's a sermon on the mount. Fans, sorry, I want to say, the players themselves testified in court that they felt pressured to pray with the man in order to get playing time. Right? So if you want to be QB1, you better sit at the uh, half 50 yard line and pray with the coach after the game. But here's the real rub. Here's why the school actually got involved. They were actually, the school was actually going to let him basically get away with this until it became such a media firestorm that fans started showing up at the game and bum-rushing the field to join in with the prayer. And of course, the parents, because high school football parents in some of the rural communities, <laughs> whoo, <laughs> they, they's built different. <laughs> I'm from Long Island. We, don't, we didn't have that. Um, and the, the parents were then harassing football players who weren't at the 50-yard line praying with the coach and the rest of the team. That's when the school got involved. It turned into an entire media circus. The only thing that was different from what Joe Kennedy was doing and actual church was a sacrament, right? 
Like if he, the only, if he had said, this football is now the body of Christ. And I get that, that was the only thing it was missing. <laughs> to find hostility to religion in a case where the man was imposing his religion on everybody else, Neil Gorsuch had to straight up make up a different person, make up a different case, make up a different set of facts and rule on that. He had to invent whole cloth, a man who was being persecuted because the real life guy was not. And just as the coda to that story, after this case come down, after the ruling, Joe Kennedy has to be reinstated. He's back on the team. Do you know what Joe Kennedy did two weeks later? He quit. Media circus over. Hold on to this thought about lying because it's going to be important. In the next case I want to talk about, which I promise, uh, again, I'm going to have time for questions. I've timed this out. We're going to be good. Um, the next case I want to talk about, which is 303 Creative versus Alanis. Lisa already mentioned it. This is the case about the Colorado woman named Lori Smith who wanted to start a marriage website design invitation business that explicitly discriminated against LGBTQ people, which would have been a violation of the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act, again, a generally applicable secular law. The Supreme Court, of course, said bigotry was okay. <laughs> I mean, at this point, obviously, right? Now, in this particular case, the court ruled for Smith on free speech grounds, not free exercise grounds. What that essentially means is that uh, Smith was allowed to say or not say what she wanted to say, and what the court said it wasn't about her religion. But that, even that media spin misses the case because, it's a, it, because it takes kind of the poor framing that what this case was really about was whether or not gay people wanted to force Smith to jump out of a cake and be like, I love gay people, which is not what anybody <laughs> was asking her to do. What Smith actually wanted to do, the thing that started this entire case off, was that Smith wanted to post on her website that she would not serve same-sex couples. She wanted to make that as a statement. She wanted to, again, impose her religious, her religious beliefs on the entire public marketplace that same-sex couples were not welcome in her store before any same-sex couple asked her to do a damn thing. As most people here already know, Smith had no business. She had no clients. She had no website. Nobody wanted Smith to design anything. <laughs> this entire case is because Lori Smith woke up, I assume, in the shower one day and thought, hmm, it would be great if I could discriminate against gay people. What if I designed an entire business for that purpose? But again, Smith, six to three, and again, written by Neil Gorsuch. He again made things up. This time, Gorsuch had to make up a theoretical business with imagined clients to f who, who, in order to get to his desired conclusion that Lori Smith's rights were being taken away. To create the illusion of hostility, Gorsuch had to make it up because in the real world, Lori Smith was not in trouble. Nobody was persecuting her for her beliefs. Nobody was forcing her to do anything. If they asked her to do something, if they had said, Lori Smith, you have this business, can you can you function in your business for me? What they would have been asking her to do is direct people to, her, to their William sonoma catalog, right? This is not, the, the, the other part of the media problem here is that this got really wrapped into like, oh, but it's creativity. How can you force a person to be creative for, this wasn't about creativity. All right, if, if it was a case about creativity, I would probably have a different answer, right? If you, you can't tell us, I'll, I'll take, I, let's pretend I can sculpt. I can't, but let's pretend, I'm Plato man and I can sculpt things and I'm really good at it. And Donald Trump is like, can you sculpt me? And I was like, hell no. <laughs> and if you, if to make, you're gonna have to put me in jail to make me do that, right? Sculpting is somewhat obviously a creative enterprise that the government cannot force me to do. I don't gotta sculpt nobody that I don't like, right? Same for, I don't have to give a speech for anybody I don't like. like all, this is not that case. This is the equivalent of a 
subway person saying, I will not make you a sandwich because I am a sandwich artist. <laughs> and so I cannot give you bologna and cheese. Like what is that? This is a basic public accommodation service. And while some might think that there is some version of website design of marriage proposal sending out of that would become creative, the point is we don't know. That's the point, like if we had had a real case with a real business and a real client, they would have asked her to do something. And then she would have said no. And then we can assess whether or not what they asked her to do was actually a violation of her free speech rights or if they were simple anti if, they, if it was simple bigotry under a different name. But nobody asked. And that is why the conservatives had to make it up because they couldn't get to where they wanted to go if they had to deal with real people. The connection between 303 Creative and the Kennedy praying football cage, case is that religious freedom is not under attack in this country. Free exercise of religion is not under attack in this country. Nobody is being fed to lions. <laughs> Nobody is being forced to renounce their God. People are simply being asked to chew with their mouths closed <laughs> in a respectable society. <laughs> to find hostility, the Supreme Court has to literally lie about the facts of the cases in front of them. And that is why what is under attack in this country is secularism. It's the truth. It's equality. What's under attack are these normal, generally applicable, generally applicable principles of comity and good faith and social understanding. That's what's under attack, and it's under attack, it's, under, it's an attack that is being led by the Supreme Court of the United States. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for this award. I've got 16 minutes. I would love to hear some questions. We can talk about these cases, other cases, cases that are, really, that's. I, Thank you, thank you very much. All right, let's go. Thank you uh, for your speech. I follow you on Twitter. You are uh, as intelligent as you are insightful and funny as fast and ah, I love you. Uh, my question is to your religion. Are you an orthodox Minecrafter or, <laughs> or an HP love Minecrafter? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a long suffering medicist. Uh, uh, um, for the for the New York as a New York Mets fan, um, that is my that is my laundry. No, the the the, the personal backstory answer is that uh, like so many, I am a I'm a very very lapsed Catholic. Um, I I've, there was a big thing where like the where my wife also my wife literally went to a Catholic convent in Zimbabwe, um, and then kind of rejected that life. Um, but the, where we wanted to get married, I wanted to get married in a church, not because, of the, because it was like really cool looking and they had like a trumpet player and it was awesome. And they were like, great, you have to do pre -cana. I'm like, what is that? And they told me what pre was and I was like, okay, that sucks. That's, <laughs> that's bad. So my, my last, so this is all to a point. So the last time that I went to confessional was right after my wedding where I had to tell the priest that I had lied all the way up to the point so that I could get the priest to marry. <laughs> but I just wanted to feel right with God at that moment, and then that was pretty much it. <laughs> Is it me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, thank you so much for speaking, you're amazing. Um, I just, when you were talking, I'm curious how historical precedence comes into play as a legal defense for why Christians should be allowed to continue doing what they do in a public forum. That's what I heard from city council meetings. Was yeah. Because they'd always done it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that doesn't work. Uh, but as Lisa kind of already alluded to, the idea that the court is bound by anything, 
even its own precedents, is just wrong. So a lot of times, one of the, one of the things I try to explain to people is that there are great arguments that I can make, that you can make, that name your favorite lawyer uh, that you see that he can make, right? The, the guys from Suits can make. It doesn't matter because the court isn't bound by arguments or logic. They're bound by the outcomes that they want, right? And so there's no level of argumentative flourish or flair or historical evidence or, or there's, as I said, two of these cases that I'm talking about, they're based on lies. The, the plaintiffs just made up stuff. And it's, the, the Kennedy case is particularly egregious to me because in, so you know, Gorsuch writes the majority opinion, so does, some, so does Senor Mayor dissents. And in her dissent, she puts in a picture of what the man was actually doing, because it was that obvious. There was just a picture in the newspaper. You could see that the man that Gorsuch had created was a lie. He doesn't care. And so one of the big problems that people have to deal with when you're talking about the Supreme Court is that they don't care about your facts, they don't care about your logic, they don't care about your arguments. They care about whether or not they've got five votes to win. And if they've got five votes to win, they're going to do it. So, yeah, no, uh, the... the, the when, when they say that they're grounding their precedents and the, when they talk about originalism, when they talk, whenever they talk about, I'm not saying that they are completely bad faith in terms of believing these arguments or not, but I'm saying it doesn't matter that even when you pierce through the arguments, they just roll back to something else. When he was uh, uh, getting rid of affirmative action, Clarence Thomas, so one of the things, one of the reasons Thomas said he could get rid of affirmative action was that the 14th Amendment at the time didn't mean uh, racial, uh, proactive programs for racial equality. This was factually untrue because one of the first things that was passed after the 14th Amendment was the Freedmen's Bureau, which was kind of directly about promoting racial equality through ameliorative programs. And Thomas, in his opinion, went through this whole discussion about how the Freedmen's Bureau wasn't just for freed slaves. He's wrong, but like what, what as, I have already quoted Lord of the Rings once, but it's like, what can men do against such reckless hate? Like you just, you can't get around that, right? Hello, Mr. Mistal. It's uh, lovely to see you. Uh, I have to say that your abortion chapter in your most recent book has some of the best rhetoric for redefining the abortion fight. So thank you for that. The state's interest language is really good, people. Um, I'm an attorney. I, I work for Thomson Reuters uh, doing very boring Supreme Court stuff. I have felt like I've noticed a difference in the last, uh, well, since the Trump administration in terms of how far the Supreme Court is willing to move from precedent. And I'm just curious um, if you have anything to, to say about that. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for the compliment. Um, my wife read the abortion chapter and she was like, wow you were actually listening to me when I was pregnant. <laughs> Indeed. It's kind of hard not to, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so where, where the court has gone kind of on fleek, if you will, um, is the change, there, there are two critical changes and we both know them. One is the change from Anthony Kennedy to Brett Kavanaugh. The other is the change from Ruth Bader Ginsburg to um, Amy Coney Barrett, but let me explain why those two changes are so critically important, right? It's not just that Kavanaugh is an alleged attempted rapist and a horrible person. It's not just that. Um, people have to understand that the way a case gets up to the Supreme Court is by the process of granting certiorari. I'm probably not pronouncing that word right because I just write it. I don't usually say it. But the process of, you know, there's something like 7,000 cases that get appealed to the Supreme Court every year, and only about 100 they'll actually hear. Well, how do they pick the 100? It's this process of granting cert. It takes four votes to get cert, not five. And so when you have replaced Kavanaugh, uh, Kennedy with Kavanaugh, what you got was your fourth vote for the very most ridiculous Republican arguments available, right? Because now you could link up Thomas and Alito, who were always bad. Gorsuch, who functionally appraised Scalia, who was always bad. You could link up those three nihilists with, you know, uh, uh, Beer Boy. And that gave them four for all of the, for the crazy stuff, right? So now all of the cases are framed 
from the perspective of the crazy stuff, because they always have four votes for that. The other big change, obviously, Amy Coney Barrett to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, people say, well, like, does, that, does that really matter because you just went from five to six, right? Well, think about the cert process, but now think about it in the reverse. If you are a liberal and you want to hear a case, you need four votes. But when you lose Ginsburg and you replace her with Barrett, you lose the fourth vote. So now liberals, people who have meritorious arguments to move the law, either to keep the law the same or move the law a little bit to the left, now they can't get their cases heard in front of the Supreme Court because they don't got four votes. So these two changes, just in terms of the kinds of arguments that you hear, that's why the kinds of arguments that you've heard have become so increasingly extremist and right-wing and ridiculous because they now have the votes to hear them. And then what they actually do with the case later, it almost matters less. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, obviously, but if you look at, you know, looking at something like Dobbs. But like, Dobbs doesn't get heard in a world where Ginsburg and Kennedy are on the court. Right? It doesn't even make it up there because they don't got four votes to overturn Roe v. Wade. And I can prove that because Mississippi, the state where Jackson's Women's Health was and that was actually sued over the... They were not asking the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade until RBG died. They literally changed their argument from just enforce our 15-week abortion ban to overturn Roe v. Wade within weeks after Amy Coney Barrett took that seat. That's why it looks like it. Hi, I'm just, I always think about these cases. I wonder, can't we like fight fire with fire and like create a case where a Muslim wants to pray at the 50 yard line and, or a Muslim cake maker doesn't want to, you know, make cakes for Christians or mm -hmm. can, can we do that? And wouldn't that be effective? No, we'd lose. We can try and we lose, and it goes back to the early point. That question is premised on the idea that the Supreme Court is bound by its own logic and precedence, which it's just not. So if you brought the case where the Muslim was praying on the 50-yard line, remember, I said in the Kennedy case, they had to invent a different kind of person. So in the Muslim case, they would just say that the real person existed, right? So if you actually had a Muslim American who was forcing his prayers to play on the 50-yard line after every football game, they would say, well, that's clearly unconstitutional. Joe Kennedy was praying in the locker room, you know, under one headlight at the end of the game. This man is on the 50-yard. That's how they do it, right? The, be, because they're not based in reality, it becomes a lot easier for them to mix and match it. There are some cases, though, where there's... <laughs> So uh, there's this issue of whether or not, so uh, one of the other things that the court's been on is like a killing spree. I mean, quite literally, they've been on a very pro-death penalty, kill them now before Democrats get them out of prison somehow with their innocence claims. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in, in their kind of killing spree, they get a lot of cases where, where people are asking for um, uh, religious uh, you know, uh, counsel. Um, uh, before last rites before they die, right? And so kind of traditionally, before you die, you get like chicken and a priest. Like that's how it <laughs> works in our barbarous country. But Alabama passed a law saying that you couldn't have an imam as your, as your last rite, right? Which obviously is like, what the hell, guys? Like, you're killing me anyway, and I can't even, right? So that actually became a Supreme Court case, and there was a lot of talk about whether or not the court would be so interested in punishing Muslims that they just told, because uh, Alabama's response was, okay, nobody gets anybody. Right, like that's how much they didn't want the end. Like nobody gets, right? And so there was real talk that the court would just kind of rubber stamp that to keep, now, in this particular case, the court was eventually like, dude, just let him have his, like, this is not hard. Um, and you'll see that from time to time. Like, sometimes the, kind of the cases that bubble up from the states will go so extreme that even this court's just like, dude, right? Roberts is very, I call Roberts the most effective Republican politician of his generation. He knows exactly, he, pre, he has a really good sense of exactly how far he can bend the law to Republican principles without breaking it. That he cares about breaking it makes him different than a lot of the others. But like he will bet, and so he gets kind of where that center mass is kind of for the Republican Party, and he's always looking for it. And that's one of the cases where he found it. 
Could you please address how the media is legitimizing this rogue Supreme Court and what we can do to pull them in? Yes, I love that question. Thank you so much, because they do it all the time. <laughs> and there are two fundamental problems with the media coverage of the Supreme Court. One, there's just not enough of it. And I know I'm kind of speaking, because you know, it's kind of my job, and if there was more of it, I would like get to do more, and I get it. But fundamentally speaking, most people in this room, if Lindsey Graham was behind them in line, you'd recognize him, right? Most of you right now, this moment, if Jim Jordan, with his lack of jacket, was standing right behind you in line, you'd recognize him. Most people would not recognize it if John Roberts was standing right behind them. People recognize Thomas because he's black, but most people would not recognize <laughs> Samuel Alito if he was standing right behind them. I get calls in my position of like, oh, celebrity sighting in DC. John Roberts said that. And like, that's not John fucking Roberts. It's just some white guy. You just like, no, he wasn't at the, 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 the general's game. It was just, right? Because people, so part of the media problem is that we just don't put enough people on the beat, right? We cover Every word that comes out of the president's mouth, we cover. We cover Congress out to wazoo. You've got like in any media organization, I was, I won't tell the organization, but I was, you know, this is before Dobbs, but I was kind of, you know, kicking the tires around some other publications. I was like, you don't have a Supreme Court report. And they straight up said, why do we need one? I was like, this is why we fail, right? So that's problem number one. Problem number two is the kinds of people that are covering the Supreme Court, because if you read my book, you'll see that I do not think the law is beyond most people. It's complicated, but most literate, intelligent people can figure it out, right? But it is complicated. And a lot of times in a lot of news organizations, the people who are covering the court are not people who have the legal experience, like they haven't been to law school, right? And again, I'm not casting aspersions because he was a really good reporter. But like for a long time, MSNBC's, NBC's chief legal correspondent was Pete Williams. Pete Williams doesn't have a law degree. Pete Williams has no experience in life. Pete Williams was a Dick Cheney aide and then became a really good reporter. So again, I'm not saying that you can't do it if you're a really good reporter. But what it ends up being is that the Supreme Court kind of gets covered like NASA gets covered, right? Somebody, they sent a rocket to the moon and it exploded and it was a thing, right? But you don't have any kind of technical understanding of like how the rocket worked or what, because they don't have the tech. All they can do is kind of report the press release from NASA, we sent a rocket up and it ran into an asteroid. Thank you, right? The Supreme Court is a little bit like that, right? We decided to take away women's rights today. Thank you. But they don't really know why or how or... And then the law makes it harder because the law is an adversarial system, right? So there's always another argument, right? You can always find Alan Dershowitz to come up and say something, right? And very few people have the skills to be like, yes, that is an argument. It is a terrible one that nobody should listen to, but it's another argument because there's always another argument, right? So for those two reasons, the media really isn't equipped right now to cover the courts, how do we make it better? Well, first of all, we just have to demand more of it, right? Like, one thing I have learned from my <laughs> travails in television is that people respond to the clicks, right? When you turn it off, people notice it. When you turn it on, people notice it. When you write that letter, people notice it. Like, people in that world care about their ratings and about their feedback. And so if you're kind of loud and aggressive about it, that, that actually does kind of change the coverage. You also have to, I think, be, uh, there are good people doing the work out there. You gotta find them and promote them, right? Like, I'm happy that many of you have found me, right? But I'm like one guy, there are a lot of guys, right? There are a lot of women. Dial Lithwick, Amani Gandhi, uh, Kate Shaw, like there are tons of people who are good and who are doing this work. My boys, Mike, uh, uh, Mark Joseph Stern on Slater, Ian Milheiser on Vox, like there are a lot of people who are doing it. Um, and so just kind of find them or promote them and like roll, and when you see the article from the New York Times being like, we, the NASA, threw the rocket against women today, like <laughs> share one of those other articles to show people that you are, are having a little bit more information about what's going on. 
Hi there. Um, I'm with an organization called Secular AZ, and in Arizona, we have several board members who have decided to read scripture from the dais. One of them has decided to sue her school district, and everything you said to me kind of indicates I know what way that's going to go, but I guess my question is, when the Supreme Court decides that she's fully allowed to proselytize, does that open it up then for teachers, for principals, for school aides, and everybody else to do the same? Yeah, so... That's actually a really hard question because I guess I don't 100% know how the Supreme Court's gonna rule on that case, right? Because again, there is a, there is a bridge too far aspect that these, at least Roberts and Kavanaugh to some extent, understand, right? And so at the point where somebody is truly turning a public hearing into a pulpit, you can imagine that they might back off a little bit. But in terms of the long-term long effects of this, I'll just put it like this. Every Supreme Court advocate that I know, and everybody who actually has to get up there and argue in front of these people, has been reading their Bible. Right? They've all been reading scripture. They've all been putting biblical quotes into their briefs and into their arguments because they know that the conservatives on the court care about that. And it's the kind of thing, as one, I won't say the name, but as one explain it to me, you're sitting up and Amy Coney Barrett's asking you a question and you know that she already knows the answer that she wants from her question. So she's kind of hitting it. If you throw a little scripture at her, it might make her stop. It might make her, wait, what did you say? And if you can just get her that, right? If you just get her to, to kind of reset for a second, then she might hear the next two, three, four words of your argument when she just wasn't gonna listen to it before. Which is terrible, which is like the opposite of what we should want, but it is, it is what is happening, right? So the idea that these people on the court are, are, again, I use the word theocrats not lightly, not idly, not because it makes for a good headline. I use it because that's what they are. I use it because their, their legal beliefs are at this point inextricably tied to their beliefs in God, their beliefs in the Bible, their beliefs of everything that we talked about earlier, that America is a country ordained by God for European Christians. Every one of them, except maybe Neil Gorsuch believes that. And Neil Gorsuch believes that everything James Madison said was true, which is a whole different problem. <laughs> so that's what we're kind of fighting against. And I guess the way that I would kind of end this talk, because I, I hate to end on such a Wah, wah. Uh, <laughs> the, the way that I would try to end, to kind of bring it all around, is that as hard as, as much as they are winning right now, and they are winning right now, there is a little, there's a little bit of the dog that caught the car problem they have right now. Because they have won so completely, and they are doing their worst so intensely, that for the first time in my professional life, people are really starting to notice, right? It's not just, I'm sure a lot of you people in this room have been fighting this battle for your whole lives. And I'm sure that you know, notice that even in your own personal lives, there are suddenly more people who are starting to listen now than we're listening, certainly than we're listening before Dobbs, and I would argue that we're listening 20, 30 years ago, right? So like, the, in the, <laughs> I'll end with Bane from Batman, who, <laughs> said to the Cape Crusader, victory has defeated you. And my sincerest hope is that victory is what's going to ultimately defeat the conservatives on the Supreme Court. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.